Good morning, grandkids. It's time for another reading of a chapter from my Young Dorkly the Wizard book that I'm writing. This is chapter 32. King Conley had sent out a proclamation to the citizenry of his town and the towns along the coast to appear at court this morning. He was sitting on his throne as the courtroom became more and more congested. He had told the guards to leave the gates open so citizens that couldn't get in could hear from out in the courtyard. Dorkley and Dupree were standing to his right and left. Citizens, Conley spoke loudly. I will not detain you long. My longtime friend and court wizard, Wizard Gorman, passed away after a debilitating illness. His funeral will be this evening after dark down on the coast. This court town of Blue Haven is required by a king proclamation to be on the beach in attendance. Anyone from the coastal towns may come who can get here and may wish to attend. He stopped for a solemn minute, then went on. His son, young Dorkley, here, will be taking his place from now on as my court wizard. That will be all. And he got up and slowly walked across the court to his sitting room at the far side. As the court emptied out, Dupree got with his sister Othella and William and left the palace to stroll around in the city market. They were sad about Gorman's death and wondered how young Dorkley would do. They knew he was young and fun-loving and wondered if he would be able to settle down and take on the new job he had inherited. They saw General Benester sitting at an outdoor table with a couple of other guards having lunch. They waved at each other and the young group kept on walking. Dupree said, I'm worried about my brother. The king's going to have him brought into court today for sentencing. I haven't a clue what dad is thinking or how it's going to go. Well, William said, seeing as how it's the king's own son, I would imagine that he'd get off easier than any other citizen. I don't know about that, Othella said. Dad's always been fair with people. Also, he would know that the people wouldn't take it too kindly if the king made an exception because Dermis is his son and totally let him off. I agree with Othella on that, I guess. I'll see later today when he has the prison guards bring Dermis to court. I've talked with Dermis, and I know his remorse, but who knows? Well, I know it leaves me up for grabs for future king, which I never wanted any more than Dermis did. Hmm, William, how would you like having your wife be a queen? Before William could open his mouth, Othella almost yelled, Oh, no, you don't, kid. I'm being a wife and a mother someday, and that's it. The kingdom's all yours, brother. They went on up the street, joking with each other. Dupree's personal guard, Sergeant Gable, walking along behind, his eyes shifting this way and that, watching out for any trouble. Dorkley had some time that he was able to spend down in the depths of his spire for a short time. He knew that he would need to be standing by the throne again soon. He was busy figuring out some better potions and spells from some of the many notes that he had brought over from his dad's spire. He finally went over to his scrying bowl, knowing that with his new job as court wizard, he would need to start keeping an eye on things better than he had. He also knew that he would need to be out in Blue Haven 
privately checking on things, as his dad always had done. About the time Dorkley was taking his position to the right of the throne later that morning, Dupree came over and stood on the left. The doors opened at the far end of the court, and the guards, along with General Bemester, brought in Dermis. He had started letting a beard grow, but trimmed it neatly. He had asked his brother to bring him some clean clothes so he would look presentable. He came forward and dropped to a knee before his father, his king. King Connolly was watching him with sorrowful eyes. My son, I would like to hear what you would have to say about what happened before we proceed any further. Dermis looked up at his father. I do have remorse for my actions, but I was in a livid rage with, with Mandy for trying to dupe me into a dishonest marriage, but mostly with that man who claimed her. I'm afraid, looking back, I would kill him again. But I would be more careful with Mandy. The king looked at him gravely. I can understand what you said, but still, you are outside the law. Before the people I rule over, I cannot show partiality to my child. I'm highly conflicted on how to sentence you. Do you have any wishes that might help me make a fair decision? Yes, sire, I do. Let's have it, then, and you may stand up. Thank you, sir, Dermis said. I know that I would must be incarcerated or banished. I think that staying here in prison would be as hard as on you as on myself. If you could accept a suggestion from me, I have one to offer. I would prefer to be banished. That way I would not have to suffer and everyone I love around me and cause you more pain. I do still want to write. That is all I want to do. You could banish me to anywhere you want. A small island would be preferable to me. That's all I have to say. The king sat there, thinking, looking at his son. I think that I also would feel better knowing that you were somewhere writing and not sitting in prison here. That is my sentencing, then, that you be banished from the kingdom and that your brother become the next king here eventually. He looked at Dermis with love and said, I do hope that you will send me a missive now and then. I know Dupree would like that also. Okay, now, tonight I will instruct a guard to bring you down to the shore for Wizard Gorman's funeral. Tomorrow I will have them bring you here so we can dine together as a family. Then we will go down to the docks where I will have made arrangements for your departure. Thank you, Father. It's more than I deserve. The guards came forward to escort Dermis back to prison and they left, General Bonester giving the king a salute as he then turned and left. In the afternoon, Conley sent a carriage for Inez, and they had a quiet time together, sharing wine and food and more intimate conversation. One of these days, he smiled to himself. He was going to be taking her to his private quarters. But today was for quiet time. She had helped him arrange things for Gorman's funeral tonight, which he had appreciated so much. He had been watching how she handled things about her, how gentle she was, efficient but considerate. Yes, when the time was right, he could see this lovely woman by his side when on the throne. He smiled contentedly. That night on the beach, from up at the walls of the city all the way down to the beach and out 
bar to the sides. It was crowded with people. They all carried a lit candle. There seemed to be a soft musical humming going on. Out in the water floated pads holding flowers with a lit ornate lantern in the middle of each one, <clears throat> bobbing around gently on the water. At the edge of the beach was a structured funeral pyre with Gorman's body at rest on top. Kindling was waited to be lit. The priest had performed the eulogy and the low music turned into song. General Bonester lit the kindling, kindling and stepped back. The night was dark, but with a thousand stars above and all the candlelight below. Dorkley moved forward and with General Bonester's help pushed the fire loose and it started floating out to sea, the flames reaching higher, ready to send Gorman's soul on its way. The king stepped up beside Dorkley, ready to wait with him as long as he was needed, as long as the light of the fire shone on Dorkley's tears. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's just too sad. Anyway, that's the end of this chapter. I hope it was a good one. It was a sad one. And I will see you next time. Goodbye, grandkids.